Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Just a few issues, just a few housekeeping issues before we get started. I'd like to remind you to please enter your questions at the end of the presentation into the chat. And as well, please answer a brief survey that will be sent to you after the presentation. This will let you know, let, let us know that you are present today. Before we get started, I'd like to make a brief kind of acknowledgement. McGill University is on land which has long served as a site for meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge and thank the diverse Indigenous populations whose presence marks this territory on which peoples of the world now gather. So welcome everyone to Medical Grand Rounds. We have an invited speaker today from the Division of Palliative Care. And I would like to ask Dr. Justin Sanders, the Chief of the Division of Palliative Care, to please introduce our visiting professor today. Thank you so, Thank much. You so much, Nadia. Uh, so I'm Justin Sanders, um, and I'm really delighted to introduce the speaker that we have today. I think we're very lucky, and I feel very grateful to the Department of Medicine for accommodating Dr. Catherine Mannix on what is a a global tour of Canada. Yeah. Um, and Dr. Mannix is, uh, it says on the screen, former palliative care, but I would venture to say that Dr. Mannix is still a palliative care physician in some way, although perhaps not practicing as one. But I think um, one of the things I'm excited about is that um, people who are familiar with palliative care know that palliative care is at its very core an interdisciplinary specialty that yeah. involves um, a, a full team of people, complements of team members with different uh, expertise to help care for patients who experience what Cicely Saunders called total pain and the multidimensional nature of suffering. And so what's exciting is that we have in Dr. Mannix, someone who also embodies, as Cicely Saunders did, sort of the, the, the grandmother of our field, um, multiple specialties in some way, because Dr. Mannix, in addition to being a palliative care physician, also trained specifically in providing psychotherapy, specifically cognitive behavioral therapy. And so it brings her experience as both a psychotherapist and as, and as a physician with over 30 years of clinical experience um, to this talk. And, um, and I will say that this is uh, the ideas that may come out are similar, probably come out of the two books, the two best selling books. That Dr. Mannix has written, um, and um, and uh, and we haven't had an opportunity to see the TED talks that are available online. I think it's wonderful to watch um, Dr. Mannix speak, and we're very lucky to have her today. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome her to Montreal and to the MUHC and the Royal Victoria Hospital. And so, thank you so much for being here. A big round of applause. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for pitching up at lunchtime and. Is the microphone facing towards my mouth? Marvellous. <laughs> this is always good. This is my second time in Montreal. And the first time I came to Montreal, I was on a, a, a scholarship from Help the Hospices in the United Kingdom who um, hadn't paid for me to come to Canada. A drug company paid for me to come to Canada because I'd spent a year researching into anti-emetics, the drugs that were to become... Um, on Dancetron, Vinistron, I'm sure they're all familiar names to you now. Um, so while I was here, Help the Hospices, who granted this uh, scholarship, uh, said to me, our only condition is that you must visit the palliative care unit at the RBH, where you must kneel at the feet of Dr. Balcon Mount. <laughs> Balcon Mount, which had been on holiday the week that I was here. <laughs> So, so let me see. Oh, this is the, the mouse that's. I don't know that I have a conflict of interest to announce, but I do have a very specific interest to announce to you that I am campaigning and I'm campaigning for better public understanding and discussion of just the process of dying, however you get there, that process. And I've, and I've written books as part of that. And if people buy those books, I get a royalty. Let me tell you, nobody ever wrote a book to get rich. Um, so at, at, at the moment, if you pay full price for one of my books in Canada, I get about $1.80. So, okay, I have to swim home. I also have been invited to my great pleasure and amazement to speak all over the world about this. It seems that if you just peel back the cover a little bit, people rush in to join in the conversation. And so I've received honorarium for that. So I, I want to declare that. But what I really want to declare is 
that I have an interest in dying well because I am a mortal. And I would like you to be able to die well too. And I would like all of our patients to be able to die or at least live the last part of their lives in a way that matters to them and to be able to prepare for that and discuss it with the people who matter most to them. So that's why I'm here. So we've hoodwinked you into thinking it's a medical meeting, but I did a medical thing now for about five years and I'm so much better for it. So we're going to start with a little bit of ancient history. And what we're going to have is the ancient history of palliative care in Canada. Because actually, as many of you will know, began here. It began in Montreal. It began in the Royal Victoria Hospital. And the pharaoh at the time was this guy. Um, sorry, sorry about the, the um, Zoom things being across the across the picture there, but that would be Valmount, so you can see him properly. Um, and he, he came to visit St. Denis' Lee Saunders in London, and she, and she made him roll his sleeves up and do some work. And he came back here, here to say, oh, don't worry, don't worry, he came back here to say, we need to do this. And what was really wonderful at a time of enormous economic constraint was that the board of the RBH agreed to underwrite the formation of an inpatient unit, the first inpatient unit in Canada here. And they went on together to work towards generating capacity, education, clinical excellence, a palliative care research program that was about whole person care rather than a particular drug for a particular symptom. And the International Congress on Palliative Care was born. And how many of you have been to Congress? Okay, so a fair smattering of us. Now, one of the, one of the things that's interesting about thinking about Palliative Care Congress is that it is the palliative care tribe talking to each other. So there's this wonderful exposition of palliative care ideas oh, from wow. around the world in this city once every two years. But when you go around the Congress, you only meet palliative care people there. So what's not happening is we're not talking beyond palliative care to our colleagues in all of the other disciplines of medicine and surgery. And I find that that is one of the challenges that we have. So here we are, a tribe of people who are interested in making people feel well. And that's not the palliative care tribe, that's medicine, making people feel well. And the usual way that we make people feel well is to remove their illness, to treat it, to hold it in abeyance or to cure it. And sometimes that can't be achieved and we have to find a different route into making people feel well and reducing their suffering. And we're thinking about their wellness in those holistic domains of their physical wellness, what their body is doing to them, and then their emotional and social well-being, their place in the world, their role in their family, their perception of themselves as a human being and their spiritual and existential self and values. So I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but that's the platform that I'm coming from. So what's happened since <laughs> the beginning of palliative care in Canada? Well, we've paralleled each other across an ocean. And one of the things that's happened is that we have, in, we have evolved specialty. And the title of the specialty, that came from here too. So Dr. Mount came back from London and said, we have to have a hospice in the RVH. And his Francophone colleague said to him, you cannot call it hospice because that has connotations to Francophone Canadians about abandonment, desertion and the worst kinds of elderly person care. So thanks to that tension of language here in Quebec province, it was not called a hospice, it was called a palliative care unit. And the whole of the rest of the world, despite Dame Sicily not liking the words at all, the whole of the rest of the world has adopted the title of the specialty mm -hmm. that you, inv you invented here. And as it's grown, 
we've developed our research, we've developed our body of knowledge, we have multiple research journals, only some of them are on here. These are some of the, the higher impact factors, but you will know that there are many, many of them. So let's have a little think about the trends that papers published over the last five to 10 years in our journals show us what's, what's happening in palliative care around the world. Well, first of all, it's moving on from its origins. So the origins were in cancer care, in advanced cancer care, and when Cicely Saunders first set up trying to help patients, she was trying to rescue patients who had cancer from treatment unto death because there was no alternative to treatment. So people were dying neutropenic, septic, sore mouths, diarrheal, bald, having treatment because nobody wanted to say there isn't anything else that we can offer. When in fact, what we can say is we might not be able to save your life, but we can save your living for a period of time until you die, at which point perhaps what we're doing is saving the death as well. So palliative care originally, or hospice care, was care of dying cancer patients. And what we see in the trends is moving on from that to starting to interdigitate the principles of palliative care and relief of suffering along the treatment pathway for cancer patients so that we're helping to relieve the nausea of the treatment, we're helping to relieve the pain of ulcerated mouths, we're helping people to tolerate treatments that can cure them. This is not a specialty of death. This is a specialty of living better with whatever treatment, or whatever condition you're trying to endure. And why should that be reserved only for cancer patients? So gradually we're starting to see papers in our journals about the palliative and supportive care of people with heart failure, liver failure, lung failure. Um, and in the city where I work, we're one of the regional uh, cardiothoracic transplant centres for the UK. Anybody who is assessed for heart or lung or both transplant is, has a palliative care uh, assessment as part of their routine workup for transplant. And they will then be referred back to whichever provincial palliative care service looks after the place where they live. Because by definition, if you're going onto an organ transplant list, you are sick enough to die. And not every person will survive to transplant or be well enough for transplant by the time an organ becomes available. So this is about enhancing living during the waiting rather than waiting miserably because you're not palliative yet. If I could put a single expression into the dustbin of history, it would be not palliative yet. I'm going to say that again in a moment. Mm -hmm. So these are the specialties that I've spoken to over the last five years that I've been campaigning on. What's interesting for me is I'm not saying anything that I wasn't saying when I was a consultant in palliative medicine in a big university hospital and nobody was listening to me. But now I've written a bestseller for the public. It's not even a medical book. Now I'm being invited to medical conferences to say the same thing. And what I'm discovering is that actually part of the difficulty we've got is not just that the public that we serve doesn't understand the process of advanced illness and the process of dying. We do not understand the process of dying as a medical, nursing, clinical confraternity. We are members of that public that don't understand it, who are taken into schools of nursing and medicine and paramedical science and all the other health professions and trained to save lives. And nobody teaches us what to do when the life can no longer be saved, but is still being lived. And that's a very, very important interval in all of our lives. So it's interesting now to see intensive care societies in the United Kingdom and, and Ireland having specialist meetings about improving end of life care in ICUs, about withdrawal of treatment, stepping back, stepping down, identifying the people for whom it's worth pursuing parallel care for a period of time and the people who can't survive and need to be helped out of the toxicity of the treatments that are being offered to them. So all of these specialties and I'm starting to look at how do we include palliative care in our offer 
for our patients. So does that mean that palliative care now has to take on all of these specialties? We now need to learn to be cardiologists and respirologists and oncologists. Well, well, no, we don't. We understand the skills pyramid, don't we? So this is the skills pyramid. Here at the bottom, the, the, the orange triangle is the general public. A well-informed public that looks after themselves, that has their health checks, that has their health insurance, that have their own experience and wisdom to look after each other, to say when you should really go and talk to a pharmacist, go and talk to your family doctor, go and get some more help. And then they have access to the next tier of care. So that part of the medical community that offers care at home, family medicine, general practice, care that's reaching out to people where they are, or perhaps they're coming into one of our hospitals for a period of care and attention. So the kind of specialty care that might be orthopedic surgery, um, that might be somebody who's coming in to have refractory blood pressure, looked at 24 seven for a few days to be properly monitored and then have their, their, their medications changed. And then at the top of that triangle for all of us, whether you're a respirologist or an oncologist or a palliative care person, there is that small cohort of people who are specialists in that thing. So think about um, general public, know that it, you, you can best avoid heart disease by living a healthy life, regular exercise, less sodium in your diet, eating as healthily as you can afford to eat with your family. So that's cardiology at community level, I suppose. But if you know that you've got high blood pressure or during your checks it's found out, then you will be managed by your family practitioner. And almost always that is adequate. But every now and again, family practitioner finds that you are not following the algorithm, that you're a little bit different, you need specialist support. And at that point, they will refer up to the, the golden triangle at the top of the specialist cardiologist for more advice about the management of your blood pressure. You come into hospital, you're having hip replacement at your anaesthetic assessment, you're found to have high blood pressure. The anaesthetist is now the generalist who's going to manage that high blood pressure. The anaesthetist is not a specialist in cardiology, although she's a specialist in anaesthesia, yeah? But if the blood pressure doesn't settle, we might need to talk to a specialist. And palliative care just fits in this triangle in exactly the same way that most people are looking after each other at home and comforting each other and doing their best, that a lot of patients are being looked after by generalists, primary care or oncologists or cardiologists or respirologists who absolutely are specialists in their craft, but who are not specialists in palliative care, they're generalists there. And they don't need us most of the time, but it is imperative that as a specialist palliative care service, that can consult and advise and train and offer expertise when they do need that help. And then sometimes we might need to take over the care of the patient in the same way as a cardiologist might take over the care of a person because their heart failure is refractory to usual treatment. So I think that's the model. And I think that's the model that these papers are starting to show. So go back to the trends of what's appearing in our journals, Interestingly, we're moving on now from the kind of uh, trials of treatments into symptom management or uh, trials of bereavement models and those sorts of things. We're now increasingly being called for the other flavors, I guess, that we bring because so often our bread and butter consultations are about to treat or not to treat or ceilings of intervention. We're very often now called by other people who have a difficult decision to make alongside the patient about how far treatment should be pushed or held for them. And so we are becoming people who are consulted for our ethics experience as well. And those are always really fascinating uh, consultations. I was part of the clinical ethics board for the hospital that I worked at until I retired. Always a, a really, really interesting part of the week. Another of the trends that we're starting to see, which is really interesting, is late referrals. So remember Dame Cicely started off rescuing people from oncologists, basically. So she was taking on the late referrals. And then what happened was a, a kind of burgeoning of palliative care knowledge and uh, 
helpfulness back into oncology so that referrals were earlier and earlier in order to relieve people's symptom burden along the pathway. And now suddenly we are starting to see that pattern is changing back again, that people are not meeting palliative care services until much later in their illness. And when we dig into that, that seems to be about the difficulty of clinicians who are not palliative care specialists having a conversation that involves the words with a patient. And it seems that that's because if you mention palliative care, you might be asked to talk about dying. And we are not comfortable talking about dying. The other thing that's really interesting is to see in the acute medicine services, emergency medicine, acute medicine, um, paramedic science, the amount of palliative care walking alongside that's now going into parallel care planning. So when a person is now sick enough to die, but there are still resuscitative possibilities, a proportion of those will respond to resuscitative treatments and become well enough again. And a proportion of them will nevertheless die. So how do we separate them out? Very often we can't until quite late into the venture. So at what point do we admit to the patient and to the family that they're sick enough to die? Should we wait until the patient can't be distressed by being told that because they're unconscious? Or shall we be upfront at the beginning and say, look, if we can't turn this around for you, what really matters to you that we have to get right now? If tomorrow you're even more sick than this, what will we wish tomorrow that we have done today? Who should be here? What matters most to you? Are there spiritual things that we should be offering for you? Are there fences that you need to mend before the end of your life? Because actually, if the patient goes on to survive, we're all winners. And the doctor who is managing the patient is a hero because, you know, dad was so sick that they were talking about dying. God, they were sending for the rabbi. <laughs> and then he got better. Dad's marvellous. That hospital's fantastic. But if dad dies, the rabbi came. The dispute with the brother, some resolution was offered. So it is really, really important for our integrity, but also for the bereavement outcomes of the family left behind, that we admit when a patient is sick enough to die. And that means that we have to recognise when a person is sick enough to die and put end of life planning alongside our resistance treatments. So how do we talk about dying? Well, it goes without saying really that we're going to do it with kindness, but we need to do it clearly. We need to do it so that people understand what we're saying. And I've had so much feedback in my books about people saying, I didn't understand that my person was dying. They told me that his blood pressure was very low and they were using, was it pressing drugs they were using? They told me that he was very dehydrated, but they had an IV running and that that was going to help because his kidneys were, I don't know, something about glomeruli. OK, if you give people medical information, they won't hear dying. They'll hear medical information. And what's really interesting is when you do that same thing to the relatives of a patient who happen to be medical, they also don't hear dying. So we don't hear it about our own. So we have to be kind enough to say, I fear that your dad is so sick that we will not be able to save his life. And he may not survive more than another few hours or days so that it's absolutely clear to the family what we're talking about. And we do that in the same voice with which we discuss any other bit of medicine or discuss the price of broccoli in the supermarket. OK, there isn't a special dying voice with the tilt of the head yes okay we're not doing that but the other thing is that we need to be able to talk about dying in a consistent way so that I can talk about dying to one of my patients and say well don't trust me on this the person you know best is your palliative care nurse specialist talk to her about that and I know that we will talk about it the same way so some of the Useful questions that I've found down the years to share with you. One of the things is when a person fears that they might be so sick that they're dying, they will have a worse dread scenario. They won't tell you it, but they'll have it. 
And they also have a kind of salvage best hope that they might achieve. So ask them for it. You know, I've met a lot of people who've been in the situation you're in, and all of them have kind of best hope and a worst dread. And what I want is that whatever happens from here going forward is the least like your worst dread and the most like your best hope it can possibly be. And if we ask them to tell us that, it gives us a conversation that we can have. What do you think is likely to happen? Well, I was there when my dad died, a patient told me, and I heard that gurgling in his throat as he drowned, as he choked. Okay, that's a teaspoonful of saliva. That's the death rattle. It's not obstructing the airway. It wouldn't gurgle if it was obstructing the airway, would it? There'd be silence. But people misinterpret the noises that they hear and are traumatized by not having had it explained to them at the time. And if you ask your patients, you will find the same thing, that they believe that people drown, that they believe that people choke, and they're frightened of that, and they're looking for ways not to have to encounter that. So have you ever seen anybody die? What happened to them? Take me with you to that room and explain it. And usually it ends in a conversation that says more or less, listen, it sounds like what you're expecting is way worse than what I'm expecting. So maybe if I describe to you what we usually see, I'll stop if you... Don't want me to continue at any point, but maybe it would be useful for you if I were to do that. So one of the stories that's in my book very near the beginning, the story of Sabine. Sabine is interesting to bring to Montreal because she was actually French. She was terrifying. She'd been a member of the French resistance during the Second World War. She'd married a British airman who parachuted into France to help her resistance self build radios and he was her hero and he died after a myocardial infarction about 10 years previously and she had admitted to one of the nurses that she was terrified of dying and she was terrified of dying in agony now the nurse could have said to her you don't have to worry about that Sabine because we have great painkillers these things and I bet everybody in this room has had a conversation that sounded a bit like that but she didn't. She said, Sabine, tell me what worries you the most. And Sabine explains that if she were to be overwhelmed by pain on her deathbed, then she might despair in God. And if she were to despair in God as a French Roman Catholic at the point of death, that would be a mortal sin. And if she were to die in a state of mortal sin, she could not go to heaven, which is where she was sure her husband was waiting for her. This is a massive existential distress that had a little bit to do with pain and a lot to do with Sabine's inner essence. So the nurse came to tell the consultant of the hospice and I was brand new palliative care doctor. So new it wasn't called palliative care, it was called working in a hospice. And he said, oh, we need to go and deal with this. You come, Catherine. And so you have to forgive me, I was 26. I'd recently passed a lot of postgraduate exams. I knew a lot of stuff. And you've all been 26, some of you might still be 26. But it's the last time in life, I think, when we think we know everything. <laughs> and I was a little bit surprised he was taking me to do a pain assessment because I thought I was quite good at that. But what actually happened next was completely transformational in my life. And probably is why I'm standing here now. Because... My boss was fluently bilingual, he had French parents, and he very often used to chat with Sabine in the evenings. And we would watch from a distance because there were these Gallic shrugs going on. And she was very definitely flirting with him. <laughs> so he asked her where we should sit and the, she, she told the nurse to sit on the chair and then she patted the bed for him. Um, <laughs> so he sat on the bed and I was left to find one of those little footstools to sit at the bottom of the bed. And without any preamble, he said, I'm sad to hear that you're very afraid of being overwhelmed by pain as you die, Sabine. And 26 year old knowing everything me is sitting on that little stool thinking, you can't possibly start a conversation like that. That's just terrible. But because she knew him and loved him already, she just said, yes. Well, in fact, she said, we. Oui. <laughs> and he said, well, have you ever seen anybody down? And she'd seen somebody die of gunshot wounds outside the farmhouse where she lived in France. And she'd been with her husband as he died. 
and her husband had gradually drifted in and out of consciousness after saying all of the prayers of the priest. He was very brave, and that's how she knew that he was in heaven. So I thought, oh, I wonder what my boss is going to say next. And he said, do you think it would help if I explain to you what happens when people are dying? And now I'm ready to fall off my stool. How can he possibly do that? What he said was, the thing is, Sabine, that it doesn't really matter what the illness is. Towards the very end of people's lives, what we see is very similar. And it starts off just simply with running out of energy. People are more tired. You might even have noticed that already. And she said, yes. Well, no, in fact, she said, we. Oui. And he said, oh, well, that's good. And I'm thinking, you can't say that's good, because actually what she's saying is that dying has started. But he, no, no, that's good, he says, because it shows us already that you're following the usual process. Shall I carry on and describe what it is that we see? And she said, we. Oui. Oui. <laughs> So he said, so what we see in these illnesses is people just run out of energy. And running out of energy means we need to recharge our energy in some way. And it seems that it isn't so much eating and drinking as sleep that really helps at this point. So we see people sleeping more and being awake less, but usually having their normal mind when they're awake, sometimes being a bit stuck in a not quite asleep, not quite awake, place where they can't quite make sense of things and we will help them if that happens. And as time goes by, people are awake less and asleep more. And something happens that they don't notice that we do, which is that, you know, maybe there's a visitor or a telephone call that we know the person wants to be awake for. We try to waken them, but we can't wake them up. They're not just asleep. They're unconscious. They're in a coma. Do you want me to say it in French? And she said, no, no, I, I understand what you're saying. And then he said, so at that point, we know that if they're taking painkillers, like you take your regular drugs to keep your pain away, maybe they won't be awake all the times that it's needed to swallow. So at that point, we will change to a different way of using the drugs. Then there was a completely unnecessary diversion into the French use of suppositories, which I'm not going to repeat here. Um, but eventually, we, he was explaining the use of little syringe pumps for keeping symptoms evenly managed through 24 hours. Now, by this time, instead of kind of shrinking back and being frightened, what's happening is that she is sitting up more. She's got her eyes locked on his eyes and she's nodding and stroking his hand. And eventually he said to her, this, these periods of being unconscious, which the person hasn't noticed, but we have, join together and the person's just unconscious all of the time and I'm thinking okay that's good we're done here and the next thing he says and I'm thinking oh oh my goodness where where is he going with this where is he going with it so once the person is deeply unconscious the only bit of their brain that's still doing anything much is the bit that drives their breathing so people's breathing changes into automatic cycles of breathing that's fast that gets slower and then goes back to fast again and deep that gets shallower that goes back to deep again so if your nieces are visiting and they haven't seen anybody doing this before then maybe in some of those shallow but fast breathing phases they might think auntie sabine has lost her breath she's struggling and um, we'll check of course but almost always it's just this automatic breathing it means the person's deeply unconscious completely safe and sometimes in the deep breathing phases, sometimes people's voice sighs. Sometimes people will think, oh, Auntie Sabine's trying to tell me something or Auntie Sabine is uncomfortable. So we'll check. But actually, this is just another phase of that deeply unconscious breathing that says this person is deeply, safely unconscious. Sometimes the breathing is noisy because there's a little bit of saliva or the fluid that we use for cleaning people's mouths that's at the back of their throat and they're no longer swallowing it. That really sensitive part at the back of the throat is just switched off. And the fluid just sits there and the breath goes in and out and it bubbles through the fluid. It's a really strange noise. This is the only time in life we ever hear it. We call it the death rattle in English. And she's nodding 
and looking at him and stroking his hand. And finally, he says, usually during one of those phases of slow breathing, there are pauses and there is eventually a breath out that just isn't followed by another breath in. There's nothing special about that last breath. There's no sudden feeling of fading away or panic. It's just very, very gentle. In fact, sometimes we walk in and find families haven't noticed that it's happened. She was still holding his hands and she got hold of them and she shook them and she kissed them. And then she lay back against her pillow and I watched her shoulders relax and she closed her eyes. And in her inimitable, terrifyingly French way, she told us that we were no longer required. <laughs> and we left the room and my head was kind of exploding for two reasons. I'd been a doctor for, I think, five years by that point. I'd been the most junior doctor in every service I've worked in. You know, the person whose job is to stop the person from dying. So I'd been at many, many deathbeds. And I had never noticed this process that as he explained it, I realized I'd seen hundreds of times because I was so busy worrying about the blood pressure and the ECG and renal function and what the hell the potassium was doing at that level or whatever, that I hadn't stood back and seen that here is a process that it is biological and um, sequence based as labor is. This is the thing that our bodies do. And we can describe it, surprise one, we can describe it to a dying person and it consoles them with surprise too. And I've had that conversation now, I don't know, thousands and thousands of times. And at the end of it, there's always a kind of pause. And then the person says, could you tell my wife that? Can you help me tell my parents that? Can we tell my family that? But nobody is expecting it to be like that. So that is the wisdom of the deathbed that we have lost over the course of the 20th century because life expectancies have become so long and medicine has become so good that we no longer sit at home at deathbeds and witness the process of dying. We sit in hospitals with machinery and lights and buzzers and bleeps and we see medicalized death instead of ordinary dying. So what have palliative care teams got to offer to services that are brave enough to have the conversation, I think we should involve the palliative care team in a timely way. Let me just talk for a moment about that referral. I have seen physicians having conversations about referrals with their patients. They say, do you know what? We're still really struggling with what's going on about your sodium levels. And I'm going to consult my colleague in the renal department. We're going to get one of the kidney doctors to come and look at you, probably sometime today or tomorrow. Or I'm sorry that you're still really having these headaches. And I'm worried that it might be something to do with what's happening to the blood vessels in your head. And I'm going to ask one of my neurology colleagues to come and have a look and give us all some advice. The palliative care referral script does not sound like that. It sounds like, so, hmm, well, thing is, well, I don't know. It's okay if you don't want to, but what would you say if maybe perhaps, well, we could. Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's not time yet. I've got some colleagues who are very good at this kind of thing. Um, and maybe I could, if it's all right with you, I could ask them to, you know I'm telling the truth here, don't you? This is the palliative care conversation because we fear to go there. And yet, actually, we can go there. And if it leads to a dying conversation, you are then in the position to be able to have that very conversation that so consoled the patient I've just described. So if you can have the conversation, here's what's on offer. What we see as we interdigitate with other teams is that their expertise extends. So we learn when we're embedded in respiratory medicine, better tricks for managing cough and better tricks for managing breathlessness. Thank you, we'll take those and we'll take them to the other services we work with. 
But the respirologists also learn new skills and new things from the palliative care team. And what we see over time is that their skill in a plethora of symptoms and their skill in talking about those things that previously felt daunting to talk about rises. And because we happen to be in the multidisciplinary team meeting, things pop up that we can talk about, we can make suggestions, we can influence each other's practice. And so the patients who are not being seen by palliative care experts are still benefiting from the additional palliative care expertise that's now embedded in the whole of the respiratory team. And it stops that cliff edge thing of, oh no, they're not ready for you yet, he's not palliative yet. Ladies and gentlemen, we are all palliative from birth. And actually, palliative care is not about dying well. It's about living well. And it's about making sure that the living left to do is worthwhile for that person. So in my local hospital, heart failure, we've got joint joined up into interdisciplinary working. And these days, any team member can do the primary assessment. The cardiologist will trust the palliative care service to do a cardiology assessment because it's the same pro forma we're all using. And we will trust the cardiologists to do the touchy-feely palliative care bits of that. The palliative care intervention is not based on life expectancy. They're not based on ejection fraction of the left ventricle. They're based on what's troubling the patient. And what we see on audit and review of that, and actually the, uh, the Toronto group have published this, I think last year, Leah Steinberg and her, her lot, have talked about how this opens up the conversations about advanced care planning. And because those conversations have been had, a variety of things follow, that there's reduced use of emergency rooms, that much later before first hospital admission related solely to heart failure, that bed days in hospital are reduced, that there's a 50% less chance of dying in hospital because those conversations have taken place. So these are patients of a cardiology service with embedded palliative care. They haven't been removed into the palliative care service. They're not dying in a palliative care unit. They are living at home and dying in whatever seems to be the best place because why have we got so fixated on the room that the bed is in that we die on? Let's think about where we live in those last 52 weeks of living. So what we're doing is we're engaging the skills across the whole of that skills pyramid whether the golden triangle at the top is a cardiology person or a palliative care person, they are working together to ensure that the best possible care is available for this cohort of patients. And just as I'm finishing, only last week, uh, the NHS uh, produced an update to our national guidelines for palliative care and end of life care for people with heart failure. Integrated care systems are our jargon for our new commissioning systems. So that's not about the clinical care, it's about the commissioning of the care. But what we're being recommended from a national health service perspective is integrated care across the board. So just before I finish, I'd like to just give you couple of minutes to talk to the person next to you oh I am that kind of speaker I'm really sorry <laughs> I would like you to share with the person or the people next to you an idea that you liked maybe it was new or maybe it's just an old idea that you've had for ages said in a different way that struck you and how you might want to translate that into your practice over the next few months so I'm going to give you two minutes to talk to each other before we move to question and answer phase. Um, to Ottawa University, who paid for me to fly across to Canada, which is really lovely because I'm talking to their regional academic rounds later on this week. And then lots of people who've helped me to be able to stand here and say these things, including two publishing companies who dared to publish a book about dying which is now in 16 languages. Nobody's more surprised than me. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Catherine Mannix. That was outstanding. Uh, really forced us to think about things that we don't think about often. We don't like to think about often, but a very important discussion to have. Um, thank you. We have a great audience, a uh, big audience here. Uh, you brought out a lot of people, which is wonderful. So 
we will take some questions. Uh, I'll start with the room and then we have questions. I'll ask, invite people to enter questions in the chat, but are there any questions in the room for Dr. Mannix? Yes, please go ahead. There's one there, all over the geriatrics. Okay, so there's no too much geriatrics here. What is the role of geriatrics in this context? We're going to give you questions for that. I will too. So thank, thank you, thank you for the question. So I, I think for all of us, this is this is a big challenge, and I think that geriatrics is particularly an important area for this. And what we notice when we audit the um, the knowledge and understanding of or self perceived knowledge and understanding of clinicians in different teams is that they know what they're good at, but they're not good at knowing what they're not good at. So we've had a, a routine, a, 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 an audit in one of the services that I worked in fairly recently, I'm not there anymore, with the respiratory physicians whose um, knowledge and skills in managing respiratory symptoms is very high. And when you do a symptom checklists with their patients, they very rarely have high levels of breathlessness or cough for example, because those symptoms are well managed. Um, but they don't routinely ask about bowels. And yet when you're very breathless, it's very hard to push. And so their patients will very often end up constipated. And they don't very often ask about nausea, which often is one of the sequelae of the fact that they have become constipated. When you go back after a year of having had implanted uh, palliative care, you will find that they're very much better at doing all of those things. So one of the things in geriatrics is that it's much broader. I, I suspect really that the geriatricians and the palliative physicians and the general practitioners, we are the last bastion of general medicine, aren't we? Everybody else is so specialised now. So I think that there will be wonderful palliative and end-of-life care engagement and conversations in geriatrics because people aren't silly when they get to a great age. They recognise that there are not many years ahead of them and at the same time what could we learn from each other by better engaging alongside and I don't know the answer to that because it will be different in every different hospital and every different clinical team but I'd love to hear what happens if you experiment with it. So something about an, an approach to cultural diversity in the discussion about dying that's a really really important question from David Rosenblatt thank you for the question so it is really important, isn't it, that we have the humility to recognise that this is not a one size fits all conversation. There are cultures where the discussion of dying is viewed very differently because to talk about it invites it or to talk about it is considered to be rude. Or if that's what's happening, you do not speak to me, you speak to a designated member of my family. So one of the things that we need to do, whatever our own cultural background is, is to bring ourselves in humility to say, will it help if we talk about this? And if we are to talk about this, who is the right person to talk to? Who are the right people to have in the room? And always, I say at the beginning of this conversation, and if you want me to stop at any point, I will stop. Nobody has ever stopped me. One man's wife stopped me because she couldn't bear it. And she made me leave their home. And I got a phone call the next day from him, from his mobile phone in his bedroom to say, my wife is out shopping this afternoon. Can you come back? <laughs> so we have to respect and notice and bear the whole time what's going on. I didn't notice her distress because I was too engaged with him and she couldn't bear it. And that was my fault. That was poor practice. So cultural sensitivity, family sensitivity, it's all part of treating people as individuals rather than having a one-size-fits-all script for anything. Next question. Love to see palliative care services expand in Quebec, but I don't feel this is adequately prioritised by any provincial government, particularly ours. You're not the first person to say this to me, Sasha. We don't have adequate resources. Was this or is this an issue in the UK and what suggestions do you have? Yes, it was. Yes, it is. Um, it's grown from the charity sector in the UK and gradually is starting to attract government funding. But government funding still probably only pays for about a third of care in our hospice inpatient units. Um, and is under-resourced for hospital units. We don't have as many 
um, hospital inpatient units as we as you have here in Canada. Most of our inpatient units are freestanding hospices. So my beds were in a different part of the city from the hospital where I worked. Um, but every hospital in, in Britain now will have uh, a liaison palliative care service. But again, very differently staffed, sometimes nurse only with access to a doctor a couple of days a week. And sometimes a big service like the service I was lucky enough to work in, which was a fully established multidisciplinary team. So we're always going to struggle for funding. And part of the problem is that a lot of our patients are not going to vote in the next election. And Sasha's talking about the nursing shortages as well. Um, PABs? Physician extenders um, or uh, assistants. Physician extenders, yeah. So, so I work with excellent, what we would call nurse consultants in the UK, nurses who can prescribe. And they do offer an absolutely wonderful service, but they are not doctors. And I'm a really fabulous, lovely, multidisciplinary doctor, but I am not a nurse. And we have to recognize that there are some core skills and attributes and knowledge and expertise that belong to our disciplines and to recognize and value them. So I'm all for additional and extended training of nurses. They are fantastic colleagues, but also we need to recognize that even though doctors are the most expensive member of the team, we're expensive for a reason and it's important that they are available to them. I wonder if you could say a few words about medical assistance made assisted dying. I think we are the largest uh, providers in Canada of assisted dying in Quebec. Mm -hmm. We have that designation uh, recently. I uh, recently found that out. Could you, how does MAID fit into all this? So I'm working in the United Kingdom where there is no provision for assisted dying. So I have no experience to bring to bear in that. And I'm campaigning for the 100% of people who will die and need to understand what the process can look like. Yeah. And I think that the better we understand that, the better a person who's contemplating assisted dying in a jurisdiction where that's one of the possibilities open to them mm -hmm. is able to make their choice or able to find their time towards actioning their choice if that's the choice they've already made. So I think that what I'm campaigning to do is neither for nor against MAID. It's about saying, how, how can you decide how to live the rest of your life and on what terms if you don't understand what the end of living looks like? I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Sanders to come back to the podium, maybe to say a few words. And if you want to talk to us a little bit about the plan for palliative care. I'd give sure. Well, I just want to say thank you again to Dr. Mannix. It was an extraordinary talk and, and much needed here. Um, there's two things that I uh, resonate with me. One is that uh, in between the lines of your talk is something that I believe to be true, which is that palliative care is an innovation in healthcare that helps health systems function better through the care of their most vulnerable patients. And I think that's really important and something that we need to work on thinking about together, about how we interdigitate, as you said, in ways that expand um, access both for, to ourselves and who, who hold this as a specialty and to others with whom we work and who care for people with serious all day, all day long. The second is that, um, you know, for we can't just be a specialty that is saying that we don't want people to have made for instance. But I think that the what we should be doing is what you're doing, which is sharing with the public an alternative vision of what it means to what it means and looks like to die. Because I think that there, uh, when people understand that there is potential for peaceful transitions at the end of life, then it leads people towards the possibility of um, of meaning in the end of their life and, and engaging with people in ways that promote meaning, which I think is the other part of palliative care. It's not just about the relief of suffering, but about the promotion of healing at the end of life uh, and through the course of serious illness, which is really counterintuitive to medicine, right? Which sees dying as sort of a series of failures, but there's this potential there for things, um, for positive things to happen that we don't want to cut short potentially the possibility for. So, so I just appreciate so much the, the wisdom in your talk and, and I'm looking forward to working with, you know, part of my vision and part of the work I hope we can do together across this community is making, uh, is, is 
helping improve those conversations about dying, right? Because, and, and, and uh, it's funny, the way you talk about the, the way in which we mentioned palliative care is very similar to how I displayed that as well in the past. I think it's true. And, um, you know, making palliative care something that people want and recognize as part of the best care for people with serious illness in our hospital, in our city, in our province, and in our society in general. So, so thank you so much for bringing this work here that you're doing, it's so important. And um, for people that are available, Dr. Mannix is giving another public lecture this evening at the Jewish General Hospital at 7 p.m. hosted by the McGill Council on Palliative Care and I invite all of you to attend. So thank, thank you, you so much for- Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we wish you all a wonderful day, a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Fantastic lecture.